Okay, so this is video two for Monday, September 27th. Uh, we talked about the Treaty of Ghent and what it does. You can see the spelling right there. And I saw, sorry, I couldn't go backwards. I forget about that on this PowerPoint feature. So, anyway, there's a few different effects or legacies that come out of this war. Uh, one is the Hartford Convention. Uh, Hartford referring to like Hartford, Connecticut. So, before the end of the war, New England came close to seceding. Like I said, a lot of New England states and people in New England were Federalists, they didn't approve this war. They didn't care for this war. They were pro-British, and uh, it got to the point where they decided to hold a meeting at early in the war called the Hartford Convention, where they, a bunch of Federalists get together and they talk about what they should do in response to this war. Well, a lot of them decided to basically start talking about you know how they're not going to follow this war, how they're not going to support it, and this and that, and they start making a list of demands of things they want to see changed in the government. They wanted to uh, make an amendment to the Constitution and have it go through Congress. To say that Congress had to have a two-thirds majority to go to war. They thought it was too easy to go to war with just a simple majority with this war declaration. So the Federalists wanted to make an amendment and some other changes too to make it to where Congress would have to have a two-thirds supermajority to go to war in the future and not just a simple majority um, like, like they did with the War of 1812. And so what the Federalists also do, which is controversial, is that as a last, re last resort – they threaten secession. So as a last resort, these guys actually threaten secession um, in, during the war and say, if, you know, if we propose these amendments to Congress and they don't meet our demands, then we're going to actually threaten secession in the future. And that's that's going to be a big issue. So um, after the war ended and you have Jackson's big victory, you know, most of the war did not look good for America. I mean, we, we were barely getting by and we're barely making it through. But after the war ends... And we have Jackson's victory, and we had the treaty of Ghent that was pretty favorable to us because, you know, we probably should have lost this war, and, or it should have come out in a tie or stalemate. We just got lucky again that Britain just wanted to be done with the war. So it made the Federalists seem out of touch and unpatriotic. So because of how the war ended, even though most of the war went pretty bad for America, um, it made the Federalists look unpatriotic and unsupportive of the war in America in general. So it made them seem out of touch, and it led to their demise. Essentially, because of the Hartford Convention, because of the actions taken by Federalists during the war, the Federalist Party will slowly decline and cease to be a national party. While they'll still be around as some local politics and some uh, state politics moving forward, they cease to be, be a major party in America after this point. Um, so an attempt by the federal – this was an attempt by the federal government to assert authority was met with a lot of state resistance. This is one of those example, examples where – you had the federal government trying to assert its authority but that was met by state resistance, in this case, states in New England. So actually, states in New England were threatened secession long before the South were down the road. So, of course, this was over the War 1812 and their disagreements about how the war was going. But you still see that idea of being out there that, you know, the contract, the social contract of the Constitution or this idea of the states come together is only good as long as you feel like it's good. It's not permanent or forever. And so that concept still lingers on, um, you know, going back to the creation of the Constitution. So anyway, that's the war's legacy. Uh, I'm sorry, that's the uh, Hartford Convention. As far as the le war's legacy, um, there are a few things that come out of this war that are beneficial to us. One, uh, we get a lot of international respect because we now we've gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with the British twice, and we've won twice, so we do get a lot of international respect. A lot more people consider us to be a, you know, more verified, more, you know, true – country for fighting in two wars and holding our own now twice with the British. From this point forward, we also treat Canada as our neighbor, so no longer will we try to invade Canada or take Canada. That's another effect is that from this point onward, Canada will, Canada will now be our neighbor forever and never we'll never try to invade it again. Uh, the another, another result of this war was the Federalist Party ends nationally. So like I said, it's still kind of local and still kind of statewide. But Federalist as a national party will end, thus creating us for at least a little while a one-party system. For at least for about eight years or so, uh, maybe a little longer, maybe about closer to ten, we become mostly a one-party national system as opposed to two. Um, another result was because of the blockade, a lot of manufacturing does prosper. So that's one of the results is that because of the blockade, a lot of manufacturing in the United States does prosper in this time period. Like we've kind of hinted at because of the embargo and during the war because of the blockade by the British, our infant industries, our you know young up-and-coming businesses and factories are 
going to prosper and get better. One other big effect of this war is what's called uh, like a nationalism or referred to as nationalism, that we're going to have a very strong sense of nationalism or support for the country that we've now won the war. A lot of folks are happy that we won the war and there's a, a lot of patriotic feelings after the war that develops. So there's a lot of strong feelings of Americanism or na nationalism that develop after the war. So recap real quick on the war's legacies. International respect for two, for us for after two wars with the British. Canada is now treated as our neighbor. We won't try to invade any longer. The Federalist Party ceases to be a national party. Because of the British blockade of ships, manufacturing in America develops and increases. And we also have a strong feeling of American nationalism after the war. Okay, so we move on from there. You see the maps one more time where the fighting took place. You can see New Orleans at the bottom there where the battle took place in New Orleans. You can see the little ships outline our country that helped blockade trade out of our country. So now we're going to the next presidency, which is going to be James Monroe. So James Monroe was Secretary of State and actually part, partially Secretary of War under James Madison uh, for his eight years. He also fought in the Revolutionary War, so he's the last of the Revolutionary War presidents. Um, and he's going to oversee a very prosperous time and very well-liked time in American history. The term the era of good feelings comes out from a newspaper that coined it at the time uh, that, you know, America seemed to be very, you know, prosperous and patriotic after the war. And so they call it the era of good feelings. It's, there seem to be not many issues or problems that we had during this time period. Um, but that term, the era of good feelings, is used to describe Monroe's presidency as well. It's marked by a strong sense of nationalism. So the air of good feelings is marked by a strong sense of nationalism. It's marked by a strong sense of nationalism, optimism, and goodwill. It's marked by a spirit of nationalism, support for the country, optimism, bright hope for the future, and goodwill. So it's marked by a spirit of nationalism, optimism, and goodwill. Uh, this is mainly due to the point, due in part because there's no uh, opposing party. There's no Federalist Party or no two-party system in place to make the parties fight each other or, or con have conflicts with each other. So that's a big plus in this regard. So James Monroe was a Revolutionary War veteran. He wasn't a general or anything, but he did fight in the war. Madison Secretary of State. Um, during his time in office, he's going to be well regarded for his acquisition of Florida, which we're going to get to in a minute. Or we're going to in this, this set of notes, but next, tomorrow's next set of notes. So he's going to acquire Florida. He's going to oversee the Missouri Compromise and, and, of course, develop the Monroe Doctrine. So he's noted for the acquisition of Florida, the development of the Missouri Compromise, and eventually the Monroe Doctrine, which we'll talk about later on. Okay, so there's two uh, types of nationalism that develops uh, during this time. Two types of nationalism develop um, during this uh, era of good feelings. First is cultural nationalism. Um, so a cultural development of pro-America, pro-patriotism. With European wars now over, and that's something else we haven't talked about, but when Napoleon's defeated finally by 1815, uh, all those European wars are done. They're not going to have any major European wars for uh, many, many decades, uh, basically until the 1850s or so. They're not going to have a, another major uh, conflict or crisis. So all those conflicts with issues of treaties and trade and Neutrality, problems we had with uh, with our ships, impressment, all that stuff is finished. So we have no more European wars. That's all now done. And the new generation is now moving forward with prosperity and trying to expand westward. So we have our new generation trying to make the country move forward out west because now we can focus on those things. We don't have to worry about trading out, out in the ocean anymore uh, at this point. European wars are done. Our trade gets better. We can now focus as a country on migrating out westward. Another thing, another issue too, when the War of 1812 ends, we actually have the Second Barbary War um, that we talked about under Jefferson. So this is the Second Barbary War. Now we have a much more developed navy, much more experienced ships and captains, bigger ships now as a result of the war. And so now we go and nip that in the bud. So in 1815, 1816, under Madison and Monroe, we do send out ships to go finally deal with the Barbary pirates. And we'll defeat them, and that will no longer be a problem for us anymore either. So under cultural nationalism, you get a lot of patriotic, patriotic themes that are promoted. Um, they were infused into American society, into schools. There's a lot of patriotic themes that were infused into American society and into schools during this time period. A lot of books, a lot of paintings come out. A lot of these paintings and books kind of show the founding fathers and the revolutionary time period as, you know, Kind of idealistic this is where a lot of these ideals come from like you know jefferson and adams and washington and ben franklin all these being these ideal 
Americans who helped to de develop the country and make it you know look like it does and everything else. So that was all a lot of that develops its time because it's very nostalgic and that young generation wants to honor the previous generation during this time period. Then of course you also get economic nationalism too. Um, some Democratic Republicans began to push the idea of subsidizing internal improvements. That was more of an old Federalist idea that uh, before the war and now after the war, you do see some Democratic Republicans pushing this idea to help subsidize internal improvements to make the country better. And when I say internal improvements, I mean things like roads and bridges, things to make us make it easier for the, the country to get around, not just for like travel, but also for, like trading goods and trading, um, you know, manufactured goods or uh, hand built goods, whatever the case is. So some Democratic Republicans adopt some of those ideas of the Federalists and promote the idea of internal improvements, um, mainly things like roads and canals, roads and canals. Um, you might see that word turnpike. Turnpike's an older term for uh, roads back then. Um, so roads and canals or turnpikes were developed as a result of this time period and promoted by the main national party, the Democratic Republicans. Uh, they also talked about the idea of protecting the U.S. industries. And so there's actually some ideas about making a tariff too, which was also a Federalist idea. So this party also adopts this idea of protecting American businesses and potentially adopting a tariff, which leads us to the Tariff of 1816. So this was America's first protective tariff passed in U.S. history uh, in 1816. So the America's first protective tariff, which if you recall is a tax on imports. It's the first one in American history because we have a very, you know, um, supportive Congress behind all this to get this done. Uh, so even the South and the West, because of the high sense of patriotism, supported this tariff. So even the farmers who previously did not care for tariffs, so even Southerners and Westerners who did not care for tariffs before this, supported it because they believed it was not needed for national prosperity. So it's kind of like all the regions came together to promote this for prosperity's sake and to make the country better. Um, despite some governmental and private private efforts to create a unified national economy, um, so despite some governmental and private efforts to create a unified national economy, one more time, despite some governmental and private efforts to create a unified national economy, uh, the shift to a market production started to link more of the North and the Midwest to uh, manufacturing and production of like industrial goods versus the South is going to remain agricultural. So even though a lot of Americans, South, West, and Northern, wanted to support internal improvements, wanted to support um, things like the tariff, uh, you still see the regions dividing. I'll read that sentence one more time. Despite some governmental and private efforts to create a unified national economy, the shift to a market production, meaning like the North, the shift to a market production linked the North and Midwest more closely to production, industry, and manufacturing versus the South that's going to remain agricultural and, of course, also tied to slavery. So there's a lot of efforts of trying to make this country work as an economic, uh, you know, all-one-page country united. But it's not really going to start working because in the 18-teens and 20s, we are going to start seeing the North migrate more towards a more market economy or more manufacturing-based economy, unlike the South, who's going to remain agrarian or more rural in general, and in the West at this point, too. So part of that overall uh, supportive American patriotic economy you get is what's called the American system made by Henry Clay. Henry Clay was a war hawk. We talked about him before. That's his picture right next to his name. Henry Clay, that's, that is James Monroe in the top right corner, by the way. Henry Clay's system was developed uh, by him. He was a leader in Congress. He's a leader in Congress for quite some time. But Henry Clay develops this idea of the American system modeled in a large part by Hamilton. So he was inspired by Hamilton to make a very similar system. Um, and the American system's goal was to advance the economy as for the country as a whole. Number one, create protective tariffs. So number one would be create protective tariffs. So the first thing would be, would be to create protective tariffs, like we already talked about the tariff of 1816, which on a side note, didn't last very long. After the tariff was passed, after a few years, there were people who started to regret it and it does sour after only a couple of years. So the first thing he wanted in his uh, economic plan or American system was protective tariffs. Number two, another national bank. On a side note on the national bank. So the national bank actually, its charter fell out in 1811, as we mentioned before. So the charter went away. So you don't have a centralized banking structure for the war 1812. It ran out just a year before the war took place. 
So Madison had let it um, elapse without renewing it, and Jefferson did as well. So there's no national banking structure to help develop a currency system or a funding system for the war, which is they're going to later regret. So after the war ends, they realize, oh, you know, shoot, we probably should have kept that national bank. So after the war, America does get behind developing a second national bank, which we will develop a second national bank after the war in the 18 teens. And that does happen because of Henry Clay and because of Madison and Monroe. And then third part of the American system was uh, pushing for American improvements, pushing for American improvements in general. So, uh, and again, these internal improvements were things like roads, turnpikes, bridges, and so forth. Um, the idea was that these were supposed to help out all parts of the country, like the number one tariffs were supposed to help up the north with uh, growing businesses. Internal improvements were supposed to help out like the west and the south to help get those areas more connected. And the national bank was supposed to help develop like national currency and help out the entire country. Um, so they believe the tariffs would help the east out mostly. The internal improvements would help out the south and the west. And the national bank would help make another national currency and help out all parts of the country. Like I said, because the original national bank, they allowed to lapse before the first, um, before the, the War 1812 actually took off. All right, so after the tariff was passed and you have this, you know, a lot of patriotic feelings towards the American system, you get what's called the Panic of 1819. The Panic of 1819 is actually our first recession, our first major recession as a country. Panic is an old term for recession. So that term panic is an old term for recession, goes back a long time. Uh, it's our first major financial crisis since the con Constitution. This is our first major financial crisis since the Constitution. It was largely the fault of the Second National Bank. So here already, after only being around for a few years, the, the, first, the Second National Bank makes some mistakes. And it gets a lot of Southerners and Westerners against it again. So the Second National Bank helped cause this panic or recession. It had tightened the credit in a belated effort, meaning delayed effort, to try to control inflation. So it had tightened credit, meaning that people had limited ability to take out credit or loans. And it, and it did it too late in a belated effort to control inflation. So the Second National Bank tightened credit in a belated effort to control inflation. This hurt the West the most because a lot of these guys relied on these rely on this money to help make loans and purchase lands, and a lot of these farms foreclosed. So a lot it hurt a lot of Westerners and Southerners, mostly Westerners, because they had to rely on this credit to buy land, and they had to foreclose on farms as a result. So as a direct result, and in going into the 1820s, it does renew the call for a lot of Southerners and Westerners to end the National Bank. So that's something to be aware of. That at, even though it only lasted a few years. There was some support of things like tariffs and banks, but in the, going into the 1820s because of this recession, because it hurt them directly, a lot of farmers and Southerners in, in the West uh, turn on the National Bank um, as a result. And they do call for more land reform to make getting land out West easier. So there is a call for more land reform to get getting land out West easier. All right, the last thing I'm going to say, and we're going to end the video on this, is the changes in the Democratic Republican Party. So obviously they adopted some of the Federalist platforms, as we already mentioned, and they're all the only national party, so they're, they're going to do a little bit of both now. So this party not, does not look like it used to back before the war started. Um, so one of the ideas they're going to develop is a national bank, so their party does support the national bank. They do like the idea of keeping a well-funded army and navy after the war. So at, they do now see the, the reason to keep a standing army and a standing navy after the war. So they're not going to take it all apart like we did before. That's another change there, too. Some politicians understandably flip-flopped on issues. They went back and forth because there's only one party. So, for example, Daniel Webster, who we're going to meet again in the future. Daniel Webster, spelled W-E-B-S-T-E-R, Daniel Webster from Massachusetts, supported the national tariff in 1816 and 1824. So he supported the protective tariffs in 1816, 1824, but later rejected a, a higher tariff in 1828 um, because he changed his mind. So Daniel Webster initially supported 1816, 1824 tariff, but later flip-flopped on it and rejected the one 1828, which is even higher. And then John C. Calhoun, Calhoun spells C-A-L-H-O-U-N, John C. Calhoun from South Carolina, was originally a war hawk and for the war, and he was a nationalist. And by the 1820s, he was far more for states' rights and even talked about this idea of nullification and secession. So John C. Calhoun was originally a war hawk and a nationalist and later flip-flopped to become more of a states' rights guy 
and more of a, um, you know, nullification theory person, which we'll talk more about that guy later on. And um, so, yeah, so that's where we're going to stop the videos. Um, we'll finish the rest of the notes tomorrow on Tuesday, and you'll have your test on Wednesday. So thank you guys for being patient with me. Uh, make sure you're studying in chapters 9 through 12 for this test. And I will also post the unit uh, to test for you to study with the key on Tuesday. Good luck, guys. Bye-bye.